Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor We have an incredible team of guests today on the podcast, J.J. Snow, who is the Chief Technology Officer of the United States Air Force AFWorks, Chief Operating Officer of the Mentor Project, and one of Stonehill Innovation's seven design thinking thought leaders to follow on LinkedIn, is here with us alongside a team of researchers, Dr. Cristiano Galbiati, a professor of physics at Princeton University, Art McDonald, co-recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2015 for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass, author of more than 150 papers in physics and a physicist at Queen's University at Kingston, Canada, and also Fernando Ferroni, professor at Gran Sasso Science Institute and a physicist at the Sapienza University of Rome. Thank you so much to everyone on this call for joining in on the podcast today. You're welcome. Happy to be here. JJ, could you kick us off and tell us what brought this incredible team together? Well, actually, um, I I kind of uh, found myself reaching out to Cristiano um, because we were in search for the top ventilator solutions uh, to help support the response in the U.S. And uh, the Prista team came very quickly to the forefront as moving moving fast and uh, having a fantastic solution. I reached out to him and he responded the same day and we connected and um, I've got to tell you, I was really blown away. Um, the level of collaboration that was happening across spaces to make a difference globally uh, and to really reach out and create a product, a, a device that would be relevant and would support everyone worldwide uh, was at the heart of this team. And that, that drew us in very quickly and we realized that the right people, the right competency and expertise was present and the right passion was there. And that's how this all kicked off. Dr. Gabiati, could you explain the inspiration behind the MVM, the Mechanical Ventilator Milano, and, and its, its emergence in light of COVID-19? It was a combination of two factors. First of all, the incidental factor that I was uh, in lockdown in Milan at the start of the pandemic, and I decided to go back to Milan to support my family. The second uh, uh, factor is the fact that uh, uh, we lead, uh, myself and uh, Professor McDonald, a collaboration uh, that has the goal of uh, identifying and discovering dark matter. And it turns out that for this discovery of dark matter, much depends on the ability to carry out to completion very special projects that involve uh, essentially technical gases of a uh, very, very significant complexity. So when the lockdown started, uh, you know, myself, like any one of us, could only think of these pandemics. We were blocked at home, and uh, uh, it was a major disruption to our daily activities, including research. And uh, one day I learned that uh, this problem of the ventilators was very, very significant to the point where uh, orders that were being placed uh, to staff uh, the hospital and the wards in, in Lombardy, which was uh, one of the early centers in the, of the pandemics in the Western world, were being canceled because of the unavail- unavailability of parts and ventilators. And uh, so that's when I thought uh, we need to do something you know, with the know how that we have. We are carrying out much more complex projects uh, in the field of technical gases. We must put our know how, the collective know how, and the collaboration to use. Uh, to help out in this moment of crisis. These were the two factors enabling the project. Are physicists typically innovators and creators of ventilators? I would say not. I would say not. But the physicists are a curious bunch of people. What we do in our departments is a a research that we uh, call and identify as curiosity-driven. Now, we're naturally brought to uh, try and discover things that uh, were not seen before in trying to expand uh, the horizon of our knowledge. And uh, for this reason, I believe that uh, this curiosity-driven research is uh, lending itself to build a cohort of people that are uh, able to 
quickly pivot around the, the needs uh, for research. Okay? What we realized simply, and this is not thanks to me, but thanks to a bunch of uh, other subjects, uh, including uh, Professor McDonald, including Professor Ferroni, who will join us uh, shortly, is the fact that uh, due to this pandemic uh, that was developing, we really needed to do something different. We needed to put our daily jobs, our research in dark matter, on hold and to devote the broader know-how of the collaboration to something that uh, was far more urgent uh, and with a much greater impact uh, upon society. We were able to do it uh, quickly because of the leadership that was brought in from uh, several different uh, angles, including, as I said before, Professor McDonald, Professor Ferroni, uh, Fermilab Director Nigel Locker in the US, they really enabled us to bring a very, very strong collaboration. And it became a reality thanks to the uh, world-class leadership of the U.S. Air Force uh, through Jennifer Snow. Before we move more deeply into the process that your team utilized to create this, this mechanical ventilator within one month, by the way, and, and already has received FDA approval, it's, it's a truly unprecedented innovation. Could we pause for a second and go back to dark matter? Dr. McDonald, would you mind giving our podcast listeners a quick description of what dark matter is, what the collaboration among this team looked like before the, the pandemic began. If you look out on a starry night, it turns out there's about five times as much mass in the region between the stars as there is in the stars themselves. We know that's the case because of the way in which the uh, stars in our Milky Way uh, galaxy uh, uh, form their orbits. We don't know what that is. It doesn't fit anything that we have ever seen in our experiments here on Earth. We are attempting to produce such particles, we think they could be, that are making up this mass at our major accelerators on Earth, at CERN in particular, so for the first time since the Big Bang, by having enough energy to do it. But we know that in the Big Bang there was enough energy to do it, and that there is particles. There are particles that are left over, we think, from the Big Bang. Our objective is to find very sensitive materials, put them in a deep underground laboratory where you can get the lowest background from other things, <clears throat> because the rock shields out all the cosmic rays that strike uh, if you were on the surface. And we look for very faint signals in large vats of liquid argon, which is particularly ideal for observing when a dark matter particle hits our detector. And we have been collaborating in that way in Italy and in Canada uh, and in the United States and other countries for a number of years. And our major project right now is a uh, 50 ton liquid argon detector in the Gran Sasso laboratory in Italy. And that is what our international collaboration diverted their activities from in order to do these ventilators. Dr. Galbiati, could you explain what, aside of course from the urgency, the urgent need for ventilators, what was it that made this team decide, you know, let's pivot during this, this time. We think we can make a difference in, in creating something that's really completely different from what our day-to-day -day research activities are focused on. I think uh, everyone in the team uh, felt uh, very personally this uh, need of helping out on the on the pandemics. When we started this enterprise, I remember it very well. When I first reached out to, to a few collaborators, it was the day of March 20th. The pandemics had not yet arrived in the US or in other parts of Europe, but it was already running very strongly in Italy. And every one of the collaborators as a strong li links to Italy because of uh, the many collaborators in Italy and the lab in Italy. And I would say they were all very, very sympathetic from the very beginning uh, to uh, cooperate on a project uh, that could do some good uh, for the ventilators in Italy, in the US, in Canada, and elsewhere. So everyone was very personally into it for uh, uh, their links uh, to the project. But besides this, uh, uh, there was also something uh, that was uh, deeply interesting from the standpoint of the technology underlying. Because it is true that uh, 
in this collaboration, we have some of the best experts in the world of particle physics in the handling of technical gases. Also, some people that have a very strong expertise in uh, uh, controls uh, of equipment uh, with uh, advanced uh, technologies of computing and uh, electronic controls. And uh, it was also the technological aspects of this challenge that were uh, of interest to a variety of uh, collaborators uh, and uh, found them uh, uh, also quite uh, challenging and interesting from a technological standpoint to deliver a ventilator that has uh, some uh, characteristics of uh, truly excellent performance. So it was a combination of a personal affection and personal attention to the problem of the pandemics and the care for COVID-19 patients and technological interest. Dr. Ferroni, you've said that the creation of this ventilator is a demonstration that the particle physics community pays attention to the application of basic research for social need can you tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, the world of particle phys physics is rather complex for the average person to understand, right? It's often quite invisible. And so communicating around it, storytelling around it is critical work. And could you tell us a little bit about how, how inventions like this help to bring you know, the work that you do as physicists into a little a bit of a deeper understanding for the everyday person? Well, as you said, the, the word particle physics doesn't really excite uh, anybody except those that practice the <laughs> disciplines. We are, of course, enthusiasts of doing particle physics because we we believe that in, in doing particle physics, uh, we have a chance uh, to, uh, to understand more on the nature of uh, the universe uh, and on the law that uh, fundamentally governs uh, the, the universe, uh, which is so beautiful and around us. Now, we are conscious uh, that many um, uh, applications that uh, we have developed for, for studying these particles have already demonstrated uh, their ability in solving critical issues uh, for the society. But I think that I want to, to, to go back. Just because particle physics is such a, 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 a evanescent concept, something that you cannot see, something that people say, but what, what they are looking at, how they do. And the key is how they do. To, 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 un, to understand and study something that is extremely difficult to measure, but extremely difficult to visualize in a sense, extremely difficult to understand the behavior, you need a, a technology which is uh, uh, the bleeding edge of the technology. I mean, you need the technology which is always new, something that is beyond what, uh, what yesterday you were able to do. It's a technology that you cannot buy. Uh, you don't go to shelves of a supermarket or even a very well-stocked uh, electronic shop and you buy the, 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 the instruments you need. You have to develop the, your instruments. So we are constantly fighting for building objects that yesterday didn't exist and allow us to bring the frontier of understanding particle physics a bit beyond what was what yesterday. Now, it's clear that doing so, some of this technology necessarily can be translated in something that is useful to society. I want to be completely frank, this is not our first goal. It's not that when I develop a new detector, I immediately uh, think that uh, also now I measure this, this specific particle and I will build uh, this, uh, this machine for medicine. You know, that, that it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that, right? But you have uh, such, uh, such an ability and you have such uh, a, a, a catalog, if you want, of, of, possible, of possible new technologies that when, uh, often, when you understand that, that there is a sector which, which is in need. Now, medicine is a privileged sector for application of, uh, of new technology in particle physics. If you think at the magnetic resonance, if you think at the um, electron positron tomography, if you need uh, even at uh, much uh, easier uh, things uh, that, that is done with, uh, with ultrasound. I mean, all, all these applications come from particle physics to medicine. I have to remind you that the first application of particle physics to medicine was the, uh, was the hands of the wife of Mr. Röntgen that was made with X-ray just discovered by chance. So 
this long history now brought <laughs> us uh, brought us to think that uh, on this specific issue with all with our laboratories closed because we couldn't go and and play with our uh, with our toys I, we found that that was a, a moment to to grab all uh, all the things we we had around and make this uh, this progress if possible jj when we first reached out to you and we learned about the work that this team was doing with the mechanical ventilator milano it was probably right two weeks maybe into this research initiative and you said we're working 70 hour weeks i can't see straight at the moment i'll get back to you in a little bit when we can come up for air and i'm so grateful that that everyone on this and this team was able to come up for air and and talk with us about this discovery tell us a little bit more about the process i, I am enamored by the amount of passion and commitment that this team demonstrated to making this happen in such a short period of time? It was really incredible. I, I've got to say, um, you know, we had, I think it was close to 400 scientists that were spread out around 100 different institutions and seven different countries, and everybody was plugging and playing. It actually reminded me of um, Linux, the Linux model, where everybody was very flat, very streamlined, working around the clock to make the first Linux kernel. They were plug and play, constant feedback. Um, okay, we need help over here. Who can help out? It was just such a, an awesome natural partnership. I, I mean, the people and the countries involved, these are the same partners that we've teamed up with across a variety of challenges in the past. And it, it just made sense how we were working around the clock. Um, the part that I work here in the U.S. was was alongside the FDA team, uh, Claudine Krasowitz and her team. And I have to say, um, I was so blown away because they had uh, hundreds of solutions coming in daily, and yet they dedicated an entire team to work alongside this team and to make sure that we could move it quickly through for FDA approval. And uh, that was accomplished in about six weeks, which is almost unheard of. Right. Um, and so it, just watching uh, everybody jump online, we had Zoom meetings throughout the day. Uh, people were sharing documents and updating documents, everything from the labeling to, uh, you know, the testing and the reports and making sure that everything was put together uh, in exactly the right format so that we could keep it moving forward. Um, just a lot of enthusiasm. Um, it was inspirational. Everybody wanted to make a difference. And we saw this as, as being something that was, going to help um, the, the larger global population because this setup is, it's just so smartly done. It's less than 100 components. It's easy to source. It's very low cost, very durable. This is the only ventilator out there that has specialty COVID settings. Um, so you can address those unique respiratory complexities. And here it is ready in a matter of weeks because people were working around the clock to make that difference very selfish, selfish uh, self, a lot of selflessness seen in the actions of all of the scientists that came together to make this happen. And they didn't sleep. I remember talking to Art and Cristiano and sometimes it would be the middle of night, uh, you know, either in Canada or over in Italy. And um, if we had to jump on a call, we did, or it would be first thing in the morning or late in the afternoon and everybody just made it happen. Uh, no excuses, just pulling together. It was very cool. What was compelling you, Art and, and Cristiano and uh, Fernando, what was making you work through the night? Was it the, the personal, the, 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 the deep social need to, to make this happen and, and the, the feeling that it really was right at your fingertips? Um, look, I, <laughs> I want to be <laughs> extremely frank. I, I spent many many nights of my life in front of screens uh, or <laughs> fixing um, or with a screwdriver fix, fixing the problems in in the detectors uh, that uh, and, and 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 after all the reward was much less than the spending a night thinking that you are doing something that is really potentially important for somebody i mean even even if but not only because uh, I mean, after all, we, we live in, uh, in countries that are uh, rather, uh, rather wealthy. So eventually, I think that some kind of ventilators you can find somewhere paying uh, probably an outrageous price, but still you can get. Uh, but thinking that what you are doing, it might be beneficial to, uh, to a poorer country and to people that have no access 
to facilities uh, that are uh, extremely costly and expensive. I think uh, at that point uh, you don't you don't think if it's 3 a.m. Uh, or, uh, or or 3 p.m. It doesn't it doesn't really matter. You want to you want to go through and get uh, and get the product done. Okay. Thank you very much. I disconnect. Thank, okay. you, so Thank you so much. much. Thank, Thank you very much for the opportunity. It has been great. Ciao. So uh, I, what I would comment, uh, Cristiano contacted me just uh, three or four days after uh, he started the project. Of course, we've been working closely on the other project. And, and uh, uh, <clears throat> I immediately contacted the heads of national laboratories in, in Canada, Triumph and Chalk River and uh, Sudbury, where we do underground science and, uh, and uh, an institute at our own institution. And, and there was immediate response from the heads of the laboratories, but more so when they said, we'll devote our teams to doing this. On the part of the teams themselves, in the sense that they were realizing that they could use skills that they had to make a contribution to this COVID-19 crisis in a situation where they previously had been feeling somewhat helpless, in fact, in a in really a world affecting situation. And so uh, they really have been in Canada, Italy, and the United States, all of the people working on the project have been selfless, as Jen said, uh, in their approach to it. And uh, uh, it's, it's entirely uh, nonprofit on the part of uh, all of the institutions. It's a uh, humanitarian effort that is being taken universally to do something to help with the COVID crisis. And that, that motivation has led to a very, very welcoming collaboration in terms of uh, who can do this? Oh, I can. Fine, please do it for us, uh, sort of spirit. And Cristiano's leadership has been essential to all of this. And uh, uh, it's been uh, really a great experience, still is a great experience as we move towards uh, the actual supply for the world, we hope. Thank you, Art. Cristiano, could you paint the picture for what this collaboration looked like? I assume with that many different teams having to mobilize toward one problem and deliver a, a one target solution, how did you manage that, especially as many research labs were closed and people were working from home? Uh, that was the easy part because that's our day job, coordinating <laughs> teams. You know, it comes uh, with the territory. Uh, we've been doing it for a number of years. Uh, we learned uh, all of us a lot from uh, Art and from his calm leadership in the last few years of uh, doing the job. So that was the easy part, you know, the one of uh, keeping one everyone organized. I would say that keeping one everyone motivated uh, was was not uh, part of the job because uh, everyone was very very high on their motivation. Yes. Uh, there were certainly technical difficulties. There were a lot of cultural challenges because uh, uh, no one of us uh, as a physicist uh, in our uh, uh, curiosity-driven enterprises ever had to certify a medical product. Okay? And uh, now we, we have come through a process that has led us to uh, build a very significant appreciation for uh, the value that is brought to society by these people, and not only building great instruments able to save lives, but they also have to subject them to an extremely rigorous uh, process of certification whose uh, uh, scope and breadth was, I would say, impossible for me to imagine before we entered uh, into this enterprise. And it's opening up uh, uh, new horizons, a new uh, perspective also for me uh, as a researcher. Uh, I, my, uh, my wife keeps reminding me, I, I have a, a doctorate, of course, uh, in physics and and, and a few honorary degrees, but she keeps telling me, you know, you're not a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and I think yeah. we were very conscious of that. And I, and I have to say, uh, sure. we had the same spirit of cooperation from people who were in the medical field and were experts at this. Cristiano, within a week, was able to go into a hospital in Monza in the midst of the epidemic and get strong cooperation from uh, doctors in the use of, of human lung simulators to test the uh, prototype that had been put together on that sort of timescale. And 
And that continued. We had contributions from Canada, from the US, and further in Italy. And that was very important to us because we needed to have that sort of expertise uh, in order to, uh, well, we knew our own limitations, but this collaboration really uh, was very important to us. Yes, absolutely. And I assume that that kind of testing and feedback and collaboration with medical providers and researchers is part of the reason why the FDA mm -hmm. process was as rapid as it ended up being, right? I agree. Can you tell us, uh, Christiana, you mentioned the, the technical challenges. Can you tell us, you, you had really a handful of weeks to make this ventilator happen. Can you walk us through some of the setbacks, some of the successes along that journey? What was the process like? I think it was a process of, uh, uh, also for us, of discovery and adaptation. We went in with some uh, ideas uh, that were uh, proven right along the path, you know, the general concept uh, of the distribution of valves in the system, for example. We went in with another few ideas that uh, proved to be naive uh, and, uh, you know, at the level when, uh, when we first set foot into the hospital in Monza, they told us, Oh, great job on these uh, uh, pressure limiting valves. Uh, they were essentially water traps. They work the best, but we can't use them. You know, you can't have water bottles juggling around uh, the COVID wards where everyone moves around uh, very rapidly and knocks them over. So, yeah, you know, there were clearly a few items on which we were not prepared. And I think it took a lot of uh, flexibility, adaptability, humility in the sense that we were walking into a territory that was not ours and we needed to be ready to, to change ideas uh, depending on the situation that we found on the field. So uh, there were a lot of adaptation during uh, this, uh, this process. Clearly the strongest difficulties came when uh, we uh, came out of the validation of the general concept and had to go into the process of guaranteeing that this was not only uh, a tool uh, uh, to play with uh, in, a, in an undergraduate laboratory, but needed to be a real product that was fully certified following uh, very rigorous and extremely detailed international standards. This was a completely different game. Now, one that uh, I personally had never entertained to play with in my professional life before. And uh, I think it was, uh, a very uh, gratifying experience and something that uh, certainly strengthens my understanding of uh, the uh, physics and also of the relationship with technology. May I add another thing that was extremely valuable for us uh, from the beginning and continues to be the case? Yes, please, Art, yes. Which is the relationship with manufacturers. Um, because, uh, uh, well, Cristiano had a relationship there in Italy with Alamaster, and uh, we developed a relationship in, in Canada with a company that's partnered with them, Vexos uh, Canada, which also is uh, involved in the same uh, efforts in the United States, uh, and Alamaster in the United States is involved. But because of very early involvement with manufacturers, um, we began to learn all of the elements that are necessary to turn an idea into a final manufactured product. Supply chain questions. Can you actually get the parts from all around the world that are necessary to do this in a, in a rapid fashion? Uh, what about reliability? What about, uh, uh, you know, you, you want this to be such that it goes into the hospital and doesn't require service on a, uh, very often. Um, all of the things that uh, we had the advantage of working, uh, in Cristiano's case, directly. He was in the Alamaster uh, facilities in Italy doing this development. And, and we have had a close relationship with uh, our companies, Vexos and JMP here in Canada. And that's helped us a lot in uh, moving this forward in a rapid way. Because, for example, it's Alamaster that has the approval of the FDA. That's the way it works. It's the final mm -hmm. manufacturer that gets uh, uh, regulatory approval. So uh, uh, that, that closeness and, and, and Cristiano's work with them, Cristiano and his teams work with them, uh, in addition to the medical, uh, was what gave us a real advantage in the speed with which this was done. 
Yes. And the, the other fascinating thing about the design decisions is it's completely open source. Tell us about that decision. That's, that's a brave and important element to how you design the MVM. So uh, the MVM uh, is indeed uh, an open access uh, uh, project. Okay. I would classify it uh, really as open access uh, rather than as open source. And there is a fundamental uh, difference uh, between the two projects. If you look at the structure of a uh, product design, whether it's software or hardware, flows uh, in uh, four different steps. Uh, there is the determination of the problem that you're trying to address and the requirements, the so-called requirements step. Then there is the uh, step of the advanced uh, conceptual design. Then there is the step of the detailed engineering and implementation, and finally, the step of certification. Okay. The first two steps are the most important one, determining which problem you're trying to solve, determining in general the requirements, and providing the advanced uh, uh, conceptual design. If you were dealing with a patent, those two elements would constitute the equivalent of a patent. Okay? So what we decided immediately, and I think it was the right decision, is that we would not patent this object. And we would put it in the public domain, these two steps. This was essential because only in this fashion we could work truly freely with the other researchers and attract a critical mass of people to work on this, pro on this project. So these, uh, we are making it uh, open access and accessible to everyone. When it comes to the other two steps, which are detailed engineering and certification, okay, our determination is that it's best to leave uh, uh, these two steps uh, in the hands of the companies. And it cannot be any one company because you're not dealing with a, a tool uh, uh, that is a toy. Okay, You're dealing yes. with... Uh, a medical device which has uh, uh, the life of people depending upon it. So these medical devices can only be built by uh, companies that are uh, certified uh, electromedical device builders, that are qualified according to ISO 9000 procedures, and that especially can uh, uh, build safely and can uh, deploy a product uh, that can be certified. So. We believe that we uh, have uh, rendered our service to the society, making our research available. You know, what we cannot take on as a group of researchers is the liability that comes from uh, being directly responsible for the detailed engineering of the project or for the certification of the project. This is something that has to be borne by companies uh, that are uh, structured to do it. Uh, and I guarantee you that in order to arrive at that uh, certification step, uh, you really need uh, a strong backbone in order to, to deliver that, uh, that ultimate step. And that decision to work with companies doesn't necessarily mean that these will be, you know, expensive, right? One of the major challenges you were trying to solve against is the price of ventilators and the, the cost of the parts and the supply chain problems around getting those parts. So now with this, with this invention, we're able to see something that is able to be produced by companies worldwide at a lower cost, high, much more quickly with a reliable supply chain. Is that correct? That's correct. You just said I'll it. I'll give you one. <laughs> uh, absolutely correct. I'll give you one number. Okay. The ventilators that were bought uh, in March in Italy, the average cost was over 35,000 euros. Wow. Uh, on this basis, uh, uh, the government of Italy is preparing uh, a bidding process for another 5,000 units uh, for the sun. But the budget that has been set aside. Uh, uh, is equivalent to something like 37,500 euros per unit. It is a staggering price, okay? Uh, the unit uh, MVM uh, uh, will be produced uh, at a very, very limited fraction of this cost, okay? Uh, it is not for me, because I'm not any company's representatives to delay to, to the, divulge these numbers, uh, but you've seen uh, ventilators uh, built for emergency use uh, coming uh, reliably uh, below the $10,000 marks, even in the US. Our unit uh, is designed to be the cheapest of that uh, lot. And at the same time, 
to be endowed with very advanced uh, uh, solutions for the care of the COVID patients. It is not a generic ventilator. It is a ventilator that was designed with the direct help of the uh, doctors uh, and anesthesiologists around the world, but especially those that uh, in the wards of uh, Lombardy have seen a number of COVID patients and were able to impress upon us in the very early days of the projects what were the specific needs and requirements for the case of care of these patients. So the unit was designed exactly around those principles and following those specific guidelines. Yes, because certain research was coming out early in the pandemic to show that intubation could actually cause damage to the lungs. And I believe the statistic is, and we'll try to find the research study and link it in the show notes, but nearly 50% of patients who were intubated were, were not surviving. And there was a suspicion that some ventilators were causing more damage to the lungs. So, so the MVM actually has programmable settings or, or unique features that allow for it to meet the unique needs of COVID-19 patients, correct? The statistics that you cited is unfortunately correct. Okay. People uh, and uh, patients uh, that end up in an intensive care unit, uh, no matter what, uh, have a high uh, uh, probability of not making it through. And that's a very, very sad point. Okay. That notwithstanding providing the, the attempts of providing best care, uh, the percentage of lethality is very significant. But that said, Okay. If you don't provide a ventilator, the lethality rate is much, much higher than that. Okay. It's nearly a certainty. Exactly. So ventilator yes, yes. Is, a, is a very important tool if you want to save lives of people that end up uh, in an intensive care unit. That said, the ventilator must be uh, safe. Now, first of all, it must avoid barotrauma. And uh, you know, we've had reports of uh, units that have caused uh, barotrauma, spikes in pressure that have damaged the lung tissue. And the lung is a very, very delicate object. You must have a ventilator that is powerful, but is very gentle and kind on the lungs. You must also have units that have very special characteristics because the general anesthesia ventilators are not necessarily built for the care of patients that have the need of being cared for for a long-term ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Think about the general anesthesia ventilators. These are machines that are built to uh, care for a patient during the few hours of a surgical procedure and then allow for its awake- his or her awakening. In our case, uh, you have patients that are sedated for days, for weeks. And when they try to wake up, uh, they've completely lost uh, the uh, ability to be independent in the respiratory act because the muscles of the thorax and of the abdomen of the diaphragm are so weakened by this very long sedation. So you need to have a machine that is powerful and that allows for a total winning of the patients by having a pressure cycles that is very controlled and at the same time is able to respond to the patient's uh, need of uh, seeing supported an incipient uh, respiratory act that they are not able to complete on their own. There's an additional perspective that can be added to that for the longer term when we have uh, uh, drugs that are able to uh, uh, control or uh, limit uh, the impact of COVID-19. And that is that ventilators, for example, in pneumonia cases are often used during the period while they're waiting for the antibiotics to kick in in order to cure the patient. And so when we have treatments for COVID-19, then we might we will hope that the combination of a ventilator to keep a person alive when they've reached that very serious point combined with therapeutic drugs can help and get that fraction of people uh, who survive to be much greater. So all that Christian said, plus hope for the future, uh, makes us feel that ventilators are still very valuable in this way. But of course, we also have the situation where there are large fractions of the world that have not yet had the impact of the full pandemic. And so ventilators are going to be needed uh, very soon and very extensively. 
And so there's a strong motivation still to have uh, uh, the development of uh, inexpensive and uh, relatively easy to manufacture ventilators across the world. Absolutely. Could you share with us, uh, and JJ, perhaps you have insight into this question as well. What's next for MVM? It's gone through FDA clearance at this point where it's approved. What should we expect over the coming weeks and months? Well, one of the things we started to do was reach out to those areas that really need uh, help the most. For example, uh, we've talked with a number of uh, innovators across Africa right now who are telling us uh, not only do they not have the medical facilities, but in many cases, they have zero ventilators. We've got 13 different countries right now that have identified that they have no ventilators. Um, they don't have personnel that have trained on them. Uh, they may not even have power in specific areas uh, outside of the larger cities to to make these work. And so we've been trying to figure out, you know, how can we rapidly produce and get these devices into the, the hands of the nations that need them most. The same with portions of Southeast Asia, uh, portions of the Middle East and Latin America. Um, a couple of things there. The, the team was incredibly thoughtful about the design. Um, it's very intuitive to use. The manual, extremely user-friendly and walks through step by step by step uh, in great detail to the point where when I look through it, I felt as if, um, even without having medical experience, if I was confronted with having to use one of these devices or having to operate one of these devices, that I could follow the manual and do it successfully. And that speaks volumes right there. Um, the training has to be easy. It, it has to be very clear. And it's got to be something that translates well across languages. And I think the team did an incredible job in capturing that. The other part was, uh, as Art mentioned, talking with a variety of industry partners and figuring out how to leverage existing supply chains, uh, logistics chains, to move devices from producers into those consumers that need them the most. Um, and then the final part, of course, was that low cost and uh, the ease of sparing and the fact that they are very durable. Uh, many of these countries, they don't have a lot of money to spend. So for them, they need a device that's economical, it's got to be easy to use, and it's got to be something that they, they can rapidly acquire especially as uh, COVID begins to move into some of these other areas and we start to see those blooms really, really take off. Um, across the board, I think the team was very thoughtful about all of this and then the engagement with the industry partners, that was really amazing. Um, Ella Master was fantastic. I was blown away by the level to which they went and did all of the testing to ensure that we had the appropriate certifications and met the right ISO standards to the point where when the emergency use authorization package went forward, um, many of the tests that we uh, saw a master complete for the device were at or above what the requirement was. And now moving forward, I'm really excited to see the team working on a permanent FDA approval, which means following COVID-19, these devices will be available uh, for purchase and will be available to continue supporting populations around the globe. Um, if you look at where COVID is today, even with, um, you know, finding a vaccine and a treatment in the next 18 to 24 months, rolling that out is going to be a process, which means we're going to be dealing with this for the foreseeable future. So we have to have a layered approach to make sure that we've got the right parts and pieces in place to support the global population. This is a global problem. It's a borderless problem. And we have to treat it as such and think like that and all come together around it. So, um, yeah, I, I think the team was fantastic in that aspect. And we had so many industry partners come alongside uh, the SO system, Salesforce, Rootstock, Cal International, Stratalist, Sexos, um, Ella Master, uh, just amazing, dedicated their time, uh, opened their platforms for free, helped us to find resources for components that were hard to find. Um, and they didn't have to do any of that, but they did because to them, this is a, this is a global problem, but they also acknowledge the fact that they're part of that global community. And that's the part that um, I walked away from being really inspired by how that bigger lesson that came from all of this was, this is how we rapidly address challenges in a crisis especially a crisis that's impacting everybody. And that was, that was really neat to see. 
Thank you so much, JJ. Could we conclude with sharing the role that you felt story and storytelling played in, in the creation of this invention and in the communication of science more broadly as well? Oh, goodness. Um, this, this is one of those narratives. It's one of those stories that shows the power of people coming together and not getting stuck on no, or we can't, or we've never done it this way before, but finding a positive pathway forward. And there wasn't one single person when we talked to them or called them out of the blue that said, no, we can't help. Um, that's never been done before. Everybody said, how can we help? Let's make this work. Let's figure out how to make this available to everybody. Um, the big takeaway from, from this is the science, the creativity, the passion of these people uh, coming together and learning and teaching and helping each other. That's what we need more of right now. Um, and and that, that was the part that really got me excited because this model, this model can start to reignite how we work around the globe, how we reignite our economies, how we come together between nations as partners. Um, there's there's a, a really significant lesson to be learned here um, based on the interactions and the teaming and the fact that we took the red tape out, we got rid of the barriers, there were no egos, nobody cared about who was getting credit. It was just, how can we do this for the better of humanity? And what does that look like? And uh, when that when that happens, and you have a team that it doesn't matter, you know, we're just going to get it done. That's when amazing things like this happen. And I was I was truly humbled and proud to be uh, a small a small part of this project. Art and Cristiano. Well, I think the story of COVID nineteen has been in the, in everyone's soul, if you like, across yes. the world. And we all feel impacted by it, but also uh, uh, helpless in the face of it. And uh, I think that's the, the story, if you like, that inspired people to try to make a contribution. It, it really is a war against something that's invading our humanity. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's the big story that has inspired uh, the, the small things that we've contributed. For me, Kelly, the story is about uh, research and its uh, cornerstone, which is uh, openness, uh, transparency, and sharing of information. If we win this battle, it's because research wins. Okay? Many mistakes were done in the early days. Uh, we've seen what has happened uh, at the origin of the virus. Uh, the suppression of the scientist reports, uh, the lack of uh, sharing of information, which has led to a spreading of the disease that was uh, larger than necessary at the point of origin of the disease. This is the wrong way to approach it. Okay? What was very heartening when uh, the pandemic arrived here in Italy is that when we sounded out to our partners in the US and in Canada, in France, in Spain, in Poland, in many other countries. Everyone felt compelled to work in a very open way, you know, without borders, at the moment in which borders were st between states were coming up. The research was truly international, truly open, without borders, running at the speed of light on the uh, fibers of the internet. Ours is a very small uh, building block in a much more complex uh, story, but uh, if we have to win uh, the coronavirus, research as to prevail in this fashion. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much to each of you for being on the podcast, for making time for this. Uh, thank you for your dedication and your creativity, your, your collaboration. It's, it's truly an inspiring moment for global humanitarian innovation. So um, please, if you are listening to this, check out the mechanical ventilator Milano. Uh, follow its work, see how you might be able to participate and collaborate in, um, in helping to advance research against this pandemic. So thank you for listening today. Thank you for being here, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.